Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Steve Aaron, and I'm the uh, president and CEO at the Autry Museum. And it's so wonderful that to be at this home, this beautiful home, and to have arranged this perfect weather for us, too. <laughs> Um, I knew this was going to be a signature event. Uh, I didn't really realize how, how special it was until I saw the blimp above. <laughs> so I guess they're trying to get aerial shots of this. But okay. That's why I'm sorry. We had to pull you out so that you can be seen. Um, I have a number of thank yous to offer. Um, I guess before I start uh, giving thanks, though, I want to sort of, um, since the Powerball ticket, um, was sold in Altadena, as I understand, <laughs> nearby. I want to give you the, 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 a couple of numbers that can be your next Powerball ticket. And these are numbers to remember. I say, let me see. I, I think it's, you get six numbers in the Powerball, so I'm going to put six for 2023. And those numbers to remember are 26, 28, 11, 24, 25, and 35. <laughs> So if that hits, and somebody here wins a billion dollars, <laughs> um, do you have the, contact, the, the donation information for the Autry on that one, <laughs> Jen? OK. So 26 um, is because this will be, in 2023, the 26th Masters of the American West exhibition. Uh, 28 is because on January 28th, we are going to host another salon like this one um, at the home of one of our trustees, Lois Rice, up in Ojai, which will also include a tour of the artist Logan Maxwell Hajiz's studio. So that's something to sort of put on your calendars for January 28th. The 11 is for February 11th, which is the opening date of the Masters of the American West exhibition. The 24th is, that's our special kind of preview evening, uh, February 24th for the Masters. The 25 is because that's the big day of the uh, sale, soiree, um, uh, the two programs that we are putting the finishing touches on now for that day. So everyone, I hope, will have that on the calendar. And the final bonus number, which I think is what you have to have in the Powerball ticket. I've actually never bought one. So um, the bonus number is 35. And that's because next year, 2023, marks the 35th anniversary of the Autry Museum of the American West. And we are planning various ways to celebrate that uh, during 2023. So keep, we will certainly keep this crowd posted um, because we would love you to be part of that 35th anniversary celebration. So with that, let me thank, first of all, all of you for joining us uh, today in this lovely home. Thank Kathy Rose for opening up this. Um, well, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Spectacular home and garden. Um, I want to thank the trustees who, of the Autry Museum who are in attendance here today. I see Michael Human. I see Brenda and Gary Ruttenberg, and I see Jim and Jody Ray. Um, and Jim and Jody, I think you know them very well also from their work with the Masters of the American West in particular, too. So thank you to all our trustees who are here today. Um, I want to thank the members of the Masters Support Committee who are here also. And I'm not sure, I, I know Jim and Jody are here. Um, Kathy is here. I think I, well, I met. Bruce Johnson was, there he is, okay. Bruce Johnson was here. Ginny, where'd she go? Ginny Stevenson, where are you, Ginny? Here. Oh, I lost you, Ginny. <laughs> right, Ginny Stevenson is here. Um, I think I've got, those are the ones who are here. I want to thank Peter Adams um, for everything you have done, uh, not just for Masters, there's a longtime artist there, but for the California Art Club and for the intersecting worlds that we are part of. So thank you, and thank you to both of you for being part of our panel today. I want to thank Elaine uh, also for everything that you do uh, for the California Art Club. Um, and, and I guess all of the Adamses here who are um, multiplying in number. <laughs> I don't, they, all Adams should stand, I guess, <laughs> half the room. So um, one other thing I want to just say, 
because um, the Los Angeles Times doesn't always cover the archery in ways that we like. But um, in this case, there is an article that's available online now. It posted on Wednesday. Um, and it should be in the print edition, maybe tomorrow, maybe in the next couple of days. And we have copies of it sitting there, which I hope you'll take home, because this is an article actually about which we're really pleased, talking about, in particular, the resources center that the Autry just opened last month, um, which is where the collections are now cared for. Uh, and it's a really fascinating article about that process of moving the collections from the, both the Southwest Museum and the Autry Museum and, the, um, and the, the ways in which a new ethos has taken hold in terms of how we in particular care for and steward jointly with native communities uh, the native collection, Native American collections. And so I really encourage everyone uh, to pick up the article or check it out online or see it in your print edition in the next couple of days. Um, with that, I will turn it over to Amy Scott, our executive vice, executive vice president of, for research and interpretations, and Calvin and Ma Marilyn, Mar Mar actually she's Marilyn Gross and Calvin Gross, curator of visual arts. Did I get your title almost right? Okay, close enough. <laughs> At the Autry, if you don't have a conjunction in your title, it, you don't seem to, it doesn't matter. So if we can, anyway, Amy Scott, Peter, Kathy, thank you all so much. And we look forward to seeing you at the Masters of the American West, uh, at all those various events that I mentioned, and at the uh, sale and show. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, I'd like to reiterate everything that Steve said. We're very glad to have you all here. And I wanted to let you know that we've designed this conversation in, in two parts, basically. Um, the first, I think we'll have a conversation between the artist, Peter Adams, who I've known for over 20 years now, since I began at the Autry in 20, 2000. I can't believe it's been that long. I was, of course, I was a child. I was like five years old. Um, I was very precocious. And um, his longtime collector and um, dear friend, Kathy Rose, and who has lived with the art. And I thought we would start a little bit um, talking about the nature, the special nature of the artist and collector relationship. And then we'll get into a little bit more about the types of Peter's unique approach to the California landscape, the history of California art and Peter's role in advancing that into the 21st century. And of course, we'll get to look at some great paintings. So thank you. Well, I grew up with Peter. Peter, I, his older sister, Eileen, who's standing right there, the, with, um, Yay. Jeff Cowan, um, we were best friends since we were, was it four or five, Eileen? Five. Five, and we have remained that ever since. So, I mean, it goes back a long ways. And I remember your mother being pregnant and bringing you home when I was over spending the night with Eileen. And so, now, I, so does, can you hear me? Yeah. So does Terry Bredenbach, who's here today, too. <laughs> she remembers my mother being pregnant, and she says that's the first person she knew who was ever pregnant, first <laughs> lady that she ever knew who was pregnant. I think that was true for me, too. Yeah. I mean, this and that was me. <laughs> <laughs> it was very exciting. It really was. And I love going to your house. Um, it was such a joyful place. Your father loved all the musicals on Broadway and the music yeah. was always playing. And he loved seven layer chocolate cake. There was yeah. always seven layer chocolate cake in the kitchen. And it just, there was a great deal of freedom there that I had a much, a, my parents were much more stricter than yours. And so for, for whatever, it, life was so much fun and full of joy when I would come to your house. And um, as I said, uh, I, I'm not surprised you became an artist because your father was an actor and he loved acting. And your, both your parents allowed all of you to become what you wanted to be. You were not pre-programmed. Right. And that right. was such a gift to you. And I remember coming over when you were studying with that artist. Let's see, what is the famous Oh, artist? Theodore Lucas. Yes. It, yeah. You were living in the back house there and everything. And I thought, oh my goodness, that is so... Um, forward looking that your mother had the good sense to allow you to do that. And um, so I just, I always think of all the Adamses with such wonderful memories. It was such a treasure for me to grow up kind of being part of your family. 
Oh, thank you, Kathy. My dad was a very special guy. He loved musical comedy. He was always singing all the time. It was really fun growing up around nice. him. He was very vivacious, loved people. And, and my mother grew up in an acting family, too. Her father was the director of all the Andy Hardy series movies uh, with Mickey Rooney. And, uh, and he was very musical as well and uh, uh, very, very, very talented. So um, it, would, it was just a, it was, it was a, a very nice, friendly, lovely childhood and, that we and had. They allowed you to become whoever you wanted to become. You were not. Told. My two sisters became straight A students <laughs> at, at, at Marlboro, and then they went on to Smith. And, and, and my eldest sister Eileen was was a president of the student body, and then Mary was president of her senior class. And and I went to Harvard High School, and I was the worst student in the class. <laughs> and I thought I had to make my own statement. I had to be original. But that's when I started uh, getting involved with art when I was at Harvard High School. And what, what was it that got you involved? What was the first? Well, I, I found out that I had um, a little bit of talent. One day, I was just drawing a sycamore leaf that fell off of our front uh, uh, in our front yard. We had a big sycamore tree, and I was drawing the leaf. And I said, "Hey, that looks pretty. That looks pretty realistic. Huh? Maybe I'm the next Michelangelo." <laughs> you, you know, and then. Um, I was at Harvard, and I, I said I, I wasn't a very good student. And Harvard High School, which is now Harvard Westlake, it was a military school and a um, uh, an Episcopal school, uh, and it was only 15 minutes from our house in Beverly Hills. But I was such a bad student. My my <laughs> my parents thought I should board at the at at the school. They only had a handful of boarders. Maybe they had. 20 boarders at the school. So I boarded there, and I noticed that, that they had a new art, art instructor. And he, um, um, they would put up the paintings from the art class, the new art class, right before you went into the cafeteria. And of course, boarding in school, you had to go to the cafeteria to eat. And these, these paintings were god awful. And so I stole some paints, and I put up my own paints, and then my own paintings, and I, I, had, I put it in nom de plume. My, my uh, middle name is Seitz, S-E-I-T-Z. That was my grandfather's name, George Seitz. And, you know, it was German, so I called myself von Seitz. And pretty soon, pretty soon I became the Robin Hood of the campus. And people were talking about this von sites, and I, I had access to the mimeograph machine, and I'd make up these little flyers and say that, that Mr. Akins, who was a new art teacher, had studied in, in, in Germany, but was only able to uh, get to the point where he could paint the lines in the middle of the street. He never got beyond that in his education. And, and then I'd put up my paintings, and it, it, one day, Mr. Akins came up to me, and you know we had coats and ties on then. He comes up to me, and he goes, Von Seitz, damn it, I've got you. He pulls this like this, he pulls me up by my, the tie that I had on. And I said, sir, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm not Von Seitz. I don't know who you, you're talking about. He says, you're not Von Seitz? No. He goes up to the next little urchin, picks him up and goes, Von Seitz, damn it, I've got you. <laughs> and, and, and then uh, I was a junior at that time. And then um, uh, in, in the assembly, uh, uh, all the seniors sit on, uh, on the stage on the assembly, and the, the movie Spartacus had just come out. And, you know, you remember in Spartacus, uh, the, very, um, the very end, they say, well, will the real Spartacus stand up? And it, it, as Kurt Douglas is struggling to get to his feet, someone stands up and says, I'm Spartacus. Then another person stands up and says, I'm Spartacus. And then they all get crucified. <coughs> the last scene you see is about 30, about 50 uh, crosses. And these all people are getting crucified for being Spartacus. <laughs> so then they asked at assembly, will the real Von Seitz please stand up? And everyone from all, all over the, the <coughs> auditorium stood up and said they were the real Von Seitz. <laughs> And I finally wandered onto stage with, uh, with a sheet over my head and, 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 and said, well, I'm, I I'm on sites. But uh, that was sort of the beginning. And that's when I knew I liked the attention that art could bring me. <laughs> oh, I love it. So, uh, and then I studied with uh, Theodore Lukacs. I spent seven years with him. He was the uh, artist. Um, he uh, had won the Prix de Rome at the Art Institute in Chicago in 1919. 
And he was a throwback to the um, uh, 19th century. And I was so fortunate to be able to work with him for seven years. And four of those years, I worked as his apprentice, as his uh, assistant. And so um, that was great. He's, uh, uh, he's a member of the Jonathan Club. And the Jonathan Club has about 300 works of his. Uh, uh, um, many of them are on some of the top floors, but uh, he was a really a wonderful, wonderful teacher. He really trained you yeah. and got you to focus in on. Was his style similar to your style? Yes, he was very much, a, he was a great anatomist and, and, and a great draftsman, but also a great colorist. Mm -hmm. He loved color, and and uh, Nancy Murray was a great art historian who wrote one of the the books or was involved with one of the books with uh, uh, Ruth Westfall, um, the plein air painters of the of the South. Said, "How come his Lucas is so colorful? How come his paintings are so colorful?" And my answer to her is, "How come everyone else is so drab?" You know, um, and I, I I feel that to this day, and you can still see a good deal of his collection at the Jonathan. Uh, Wow. The Jonathan Art Foundation, the Jonathan Club, yeah. Well, your paintings really reflect all that color and enthusiasm that you're talking about. And then, so when did you start really, like I commissioned you to paint 40 years ago, this portrait here of my two boys. And was that one of your first, or were you? I don't recall. I mean, that was that was pretty early on, yeah. yeah. And I think I might have still been studying with Lukacs. I studied with him from the age of 20 to 27. And, and I, I did that painting. I actually have another painting that I did. I'll surprise you with it someday. Okay. That I, I, would usually, I would usually start up and do two or three variations of portraits and get halfway done or so and then let the uh, person decide which one they want. But I've got another one of, of Peter and Tom on the swings at the beach club. And you see it's at the beach club. I always love the ocean. You know, all my friends are leaving California. I could never leave California. I just love the ocean, and I couldn't be, I couldn't be far away. The painting down below, I yeah. think it needs some varnish on it, but that was something I did at the north rim of the Grand Canyon, the, the aspen trees there. And I think, pardon? They can't see it. Oh, that was the second painting um, I collected. Of yes, that, the, these are in Kathy's uh, paintings, yeah. yeah. And the third one is a little bit hard to see. And this, this big one here, I painted, actually, I painted this on location, plain air, this big. It's 30 by 40. I remember putting a bungee cord around my easel and, and painting it, and it's up at Convict Lake. That's Mount Morrison. And you know, it was windy that day, and you see some clouds and so forth. And I've got a, a similar version that I did of it, another version that's down at the California Club now. It's just and gorgeous. so uh, those are a few of the things that are in Kathy's uh, collection. <laughs> and, and, uh, and Kathy, you know, we were very fond of your family, too. And you. uh, your Uncle Edwin, what a, what a character. He was great. He was just... He uh, loved your parents, and they played bridge all the time together. It was such fun. Yeah. Uh, our families really melted together. Yeah. Gosh, those were the days, weren't they? Yes. They were just, they were just great. great. <laughs> I, I know we have to go fairly quickly. Yes. So, and, and so um, you were going to ask me a little bit about the California. You were on the board of the California Art Club. I still am. And how many I, people here are on the board of the California Art Club? There's Dan Foliar, Jim Ray, uh, Elaine, uh, 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 Michael Human, And they're all on the board of the Autry, too. <laughs> so we have a big crossover. The California Art Club was founded in 1909 by the early California plein air painters, Edgar Payne, William Went. William Went was the second president and really the, the, the founding member, Jack Wilkinson Smith and Hanson Putoff and, and Guy Rose. Uh, and um, we decided to, to um, I was asked to join the California Art Club, a little old lady I guess she wasn't old by our standards today, because she's <laughs> about, she calls it old. She calls me and goes, yeah, Mr. Adams, you know, like, talk like that. Would you like to join the California Art Club? And I said, oh, sure, for $10, I'll join. And she said, good, now that you've joined, how would you like to be our next president? <laughs> and I was about, how old was I, about 35 or 40? No, I must have been, I must have been about 40. And, and, and I laughed about it, and I told my wife right before I went to bed that night about this phone call I had, and she said, well, all you've been doing is complaining about the art world. Why don't you do something about it? I'll do all the work, and you just be the figurehead. You don't have to. <laughs> that's and, <sounds> true. 
I love it. We got exactly? about six of our, 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 we got about eight of our friends together, and they said they'd all join. And then we went to the first meeting, and uh, everyone there was an octogenarian. They were all in their 80s. <laughs> And, and they said, oh, this will be our next president of the California Art Club. And people were wrapping their canes on the table, you know, and sort of <laughs> staggering to their feet and applauding. And I said, well, I'll try to lead you into the next century, into the next millennium. <laughs> and, 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 uh, <clears throat> and what do you know? I became president and Elaine became executive director for 26 years. <laughs> I just stepped down a year ago. And, but Elaine is still executive director. So Yay. she still does all that. She's always done all the work. And I've, I've, yeah. I've taken the credit, but she really has worked. You, you know, one and one makes two. Well, when you put them together, it actually makes 11. Well, I'm still that one, but she's the 10 other. She, she's the one that oh, does sweet. 10 more parts to it. So uh, that's, uh, that's my, my wife, Elaine. And it's true. It's true. She takes care of me. I couldn't do anything without her. So, oh, anyway. So sweet. Okay. So I wondered on that note, is this on? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, if we might talk a little bit more about the California Art Club and um, under your stewardship, but first of all, historically, it's an incredibly important organization, although it might have been in something of a state of disarray um, when you found it. Um, it is, of course, the oldest artist organization um, in the region, one of the oldest in the American West, and has much to do, I think, in its founding and in its heyday, certainly um, for the regional identity that we enjoy today, this atmosphere, this light, the sort of lushness that is the California landscape in all of its variety. So the idea of an artist's organization, the bringing artists from all over the country. Many of them came from the Midwest, from the East Coast, and settling here and celebrating the specific qualities of the atmosphere, the landscape, and the environment of California and Southern California in particular, um, really, I think, had a massive impact on this place. And then fast forward um, the better part of a century later, and the club has suffered somewhat with the rise of abstraction and a number of other artistic movements in California, the rise of the Los Angeles art scene, um, amongst other things. And enter Peter Adams. <laughs> How, um, can you tell us a little bit more about the state of the California Art Club, the mission of the California Art Club? Because it's long been, I think, fairly specific and its significance and relevance in the 21st century when art in California has diversified um, and become so complex and so dynamic with all of these amazing institutions, the California Art Club still occupies a very specific place at the center of all that. And I wondered if you could talk to us a little bit about the state in which you found it, the significance of that historical mission, and how you specifically helped revive it and turn it into the, the really you know, amazing and dynamic organization that it is today, which is quite welcoming, I think, to younger artists, importantly. Thank you, Amy. Um, gee, there's a lot of questions in there. Um, <laughs> One of, the first one is the mission of the California Art Club, and that is to um, foster and, and promote uh, traditional fine art, as we call it today. Um, the, the, the art that was practiced by William Wendt, Edgar Payne, Guy Rose, uh, that includes uh, landscape painting, but also portraiture, figure painting, still life painting, and mural painting, too. And uh, the, the art that was really done, I mean, my, my great love in, in art is really the 19th century, from about 1860 to 1920. I think that was the golden age uh, of, uh, of painting. And then somehow in the 20s, and particularly by the time of the 30s, modernism came in and all those artists were persona non grata. They were, they were uh, just put down and uh, Bougereau, who was really thought of as the, one of the top uh, painters in, in France of all time, uh, was, was uh, devalued and put in the basements of, of museums. And, and so many of the, the great artists were uh, um, really looked down upon. The great news is they've all come back. And, they've, uh, you right. know, and people love that art. And, they, and it's, it's come alive again. And when that's come alive, also it's helped our California Art Club. And we've helped to bring it back, but they've actually helped us too. 
even though they're all deceased now. So that's an exciting thing. We try at the club to, to be as, as friendly and outgoing as we possibly can. I really like, and Elaine really loves, being with people and entertaining them <laughs> and trying to find out what their likes are. And especially with these young artists, it's really exciting it to is. be around them. And, and so we, we foster that. We've got 15 chapters in California uh, for the California Art Club. We've got one in San Francisco, one in Orange County, one in San Diego, one in Santa Barbara. <clears throat> Our last chapter, actually we've got one chapter that's out of state chapter to do all of our out of state members because we've got a lot of that. But our last chapter is our cosmic chapter. Yeah, our cosmic chapter. We're working with JPO and NASA uh, <laughs> to do all these um, the paintings and 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 the deal you know with the um, the space landing on Mars of the uh, uh, Perseverance rover in February of last wow. year. Um, we did a big art exhibition and paint out and we had all sorts of celebrations and we've got a whole wing of science fiction artists in our in our organization too. And so we just find that they add so much to everything else. Of course we've got, um, as we do at the Autry, a lot of Chinese artists in the group too. And they're, they've, they've been wonderful. Uh, me and C2, Jason C2. Calvin Liang, uh, there's so many, so many of them. I, I, I shouldn't even start mentioning them because they've been so important to us. Um, and we've grown exponentially in a lot of ways. We've been uh, influential with the, this art movement and that's been exciting. And that's been uh, something that uh, I, I don't want to take credit for. If anyone should take credit, it's my wife. Uh, <laughs> and, and, but um, it's just it's just been wonderful working with all these artists. It's been a lot of fun, and 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 working with you, Amy. That's been a lot of fun, and with the Autry Museum. And we did two of our gold medal exhibitions at the Autry Museum, and we just did our last one at the Bowers Museum, very successful. And and we're going to do our next one at the Bowers too, I think. And but hopefully someday we'll get back to the. Uh, the Autry, and, and certainly we'll be, you know, we, we, we love working with other organizations, other nonprofit organizations, and we're hoping to do things with the Los Angeles River and, and also with the Arroyo Seco Foundation and Pasadena Museum of History, paintings of the Arroyo Seco, and I don't know, so many things. Again, don't get me started. We'll go on <laughs> Well, of course, a lot of these paintings um, are, of, are of important sites that are being redeveloped and reused. Um, and reimagined in Los Angeles. And I think it's, you know, what you talked about in terms of the um, Chinese artists that are in the California Art Club and the um, sci-fi painters that are in the California Art Club, it's important not to remember just the diversity within the club itself, but of course, um, the backgrounds that those people come from and why it is that they're drawn, like yourself, to the California Art Club. And if you think about what it is that propels a sci-fi artist. I mean, a lot of that is narrative. Storytelling is important. Um, illustration. Um, many of these artists, I think, also work for Hollywood and they work in the studios. That's and right. so they're very well schooled in the academic tenets of storytelling and narrative art, which um, not coincidentally overlaps a great deal with what we do at the Autry Museum. And the history of Western art broadly is one of storytelling, of making, of telling and imagining, you know, ourselves out in the West, what was then a remote frontier, um, and the diversity and sort of seeing oneself in a place. So there is a great deal of, I think, sort of um, symbiosis and symmetry between the missions of the California Art Club and just the history of Western American art broadly. Um, the Chinese artists, you know, something is not dissimilar. Many of the Chinese artists have trained or been inspired by at least the the stere the um, traditions of academic and socialist realism that come out of, you know, Mao's China and um, the training in the art schools that was then uh, tied to propaganda for the party and how that translates into storytelling and the ability to convey emotion narrative um, through, through art. So um, there's a real significant, I think, academic um, foundation to the California Art Club. But I thought we might now just sort of pivot um, from that and look at the relationship between um, landscape in particular and your work and talk about some of the paintings and how it is that you, your unique approach to the California landscape, which I think is one of the most sort of in part because of the vibrant tradition of Impressionism, which thrived in Southern California long after its heyday in New York and in France. Um, 
about your unique approach to the light and the atmosphere, because there is no mistaking a Peter Adams painting um, right. really when you see it from a distance. And it has something to do, I still struggle as, even though I've been a curator for over 20 years to sort of put my finger on it, it has something to do with um, the saturation, the color and the intensity of um, those two things. And might you perhaps, looking at some of these examples um, around here, perhaps one of the studies for one of the larger landscapes, and then we can move on to the master's painting, um, describe how it is that you see a place that you see the color in it, and then how it is that you manage to sort of amplify those colors in ways that are both authentic to the site itself, but they still carry an emotional sort of weight that can only really be experienced through your art. Thank you. Uh, how much time do we have about uh, No, I'm, 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 I didn't mean that as a joke, but I mean, like, uh, you know, 20 minutes, 30? Yeah, we're good. OK, let me. Um, start off, because I've, I've always loved the early California plein air artists, but I've always loved the 19th century artists uh, as well. And some of them were very academic, and, and I've always loved figure painting. And uh, I never show figure painting at the, at the Autry. I always show my, my landscape painting. If we look here at this early landscape painting I did of uh, yeah. Mount Morrison at Convict Lake, you can see it's, it's, it's done in almost blockular strokes. You know, hard, you can see the, the brush strokes in it, you know. And that was a, a type of a style of painting that was really developed under Edgar Payne and William Wendt. You can see that in their work, a sense of design. Um, originally, that came from Japanism, which uh, was introduced into to France by Siegfried Bing and his, his brother, uh, Stephen Bing, his younger brother, who had an art gallery too. And they brought in Japanese prints from, um, Oh, Hiroshige or Utmaro, so forth, that were had a flattened uh, surface. They were two-dimensional. And uh, out of that grew a type of painting, a muralistic type of painting, that was developed by uh, Frank Brangwen. Uh, he was the top mural painter in, in uh, England at the time. And he, um, uh, he did murals all over the world, but his, his most famous works are uh, in, in London. Uh, he actually has a, a mural that we did, he did for the 1915 exposition in, in uh, San Francisco uh, at the Herbst Theater. They're still there. They're 20 feet high by uh, 12 feet wide or so, and there's six of them. And uh, they were just, they're just dynamic. And it, he has this sort of punch, this, this uh, uh, appeal that um, a lot of the illustrators, the American illustrators, picked up on. And the illustrators, you know, they wanted to sell their magazines from across the a room. You wanted to see it. They wanted to have this muralistic sort of punch so you could read it from a distance. That's something that Frank Brangwen started. You see that same sort of effect in the work of N.C. Wyeth, uh, Mead Schaefer, uh, Frank Schoonover, um, uh, all the American illustrators. In fact, Dean Cornwell. Dean Cornwell was at the top of uh, 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 mural painting. I mean, at the top of illustrating, he was an illustrator. He's the top illustrator. They often call him the Dean of American Illustration. And uh, he stopped illustrating and went and studied mural painting with Frank Brangwen. Then they wanted Frank Brangwen to do the murals here in Los Angeles Library, but he was too busy. Dean Cornwell came out here and spent five years on those murals and hired my teacher. Oh, wow. So that's a little bit where some of my style comes from, that Japanism that was really goes back to the 1860s or so. But Lukacs um, really loved color and, and different, different types of, of uh, uh, types of art. I actually call myself an aesthetic realist. I don't uh, paint exactly what's in front of me. I look and see what's exactly in front of me. But like an impressionist, I get an impression of it and try to make it as aesthetic as I can. Um, a person like that would be like Marion Wachtell. You see her paintings, and they always look sure. so poetic. Yeah. They have, um, you know, almost uh, Art Nouveau uh, uh, trees. Uh, she uses eucalyptus trees, but even her oak trees look beautifully designed, and, and they have a certain harmony. Um, this painting over here that I'm doing, and this is going into the Masters, and I've been painting recently a lot of seascapes. I figure the American West 
Well, that's seascapes, isn't it? I mean, yeah. that's uh, that includes the and then and then a lot of the cowboys. Wyatt Earp spent a lot of time in California and San Diego and Los Angeles and Bat Masterson too, so they weren't unfamiliar with the Pacific Ocean. And growing up by the ocean and surfing, I've always enjoyed. I just love the ocean. I, I and and you can see that I I wanted to paint Kathy's kids at the ocean yes. <laughs> when I started off. Um, this painting here is um, a little a little cove in uh, Point Lobos up uh, by uh, Carmel. And um, I wanted to show the, the churning and the movement and the ebb and flow of the waves. And, um, you know, studying art, some of my favorite artists were of all time were the Chinese landscape painters. And way back, they started doing landscape painting long before the Westerners started doing landscape painting. You know, we, we trace our heritage back to the divine Claude, Claude Lorraine, who was born in 1600 and died about 1680 or so. So he was really prolific in the 1640s. But the earliest Chinese landscape paintings go back to, you know, a thousand, uh, well before, you know, 1600, 600 years before uh, Claude Lorraine. Uh, one of my favorite ones was from the Southern Song Dynasty, and that was the dynasty, you know, there was a Song Dynasty, and after that there was a Southern Song, because they moved the dynasty from Peking to, to Hangzhou, um, because the Mongols were coming in. That's when Kublai Khan and, and so forth, and Genghis Khan were coming in. And so, in the Southern Song Dynasty, Hangzhou was the center of Chinese landscape painting, and there was a wonderful artist by the name of Ma Yuan, and he was known as the One Corner Ma. And I used a lot of his um, um, composition in this, One Corner Ma. See, I, here, I don't know if you can see it over here. Over here, I've got the, um, the wave breaking. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, this wave breaking right here. Thank you, Amy. And that's the One Corner. But I've echoed it again here, and then I've echoed it here, and then I've echoed it there, too. So it keeps the eye moving through the painting. That's something I got from actually the Chinese landscape painters. And it's really a, a, a kind of a, a fun thing to do. And I just love the way, I, you know, to paint the ocean and the surface of the ocean and the wave just coming, coming in like this and the way the sunlight hits it. It's really kind of a fun thing to do. So, okay, now we can put this back. One question, or please sure, talk please, about one please. little aspect of this painting that I've been noticing as I'm like right here up against it, and um, it might be a little tough to see for some of the people that are further away. But in the greens and the yellows that are here, there's not just green, or it's not blue or green. It's yellow and it's orange, and there's at least like 20 different colors mm -hmm. in there. And maybe you can talk a little bit about the way that you use color to create light, because, and of course, this is a transparent part of the surf, you know, the little sort of um, layer of water as it brushes up over the sand. How is that? Yeah, that's the really fun part. I mean, that's where I really have fun, is playing with color. And when I do pastels, it's just like, Finger painting. I just love putting color down, and then I adjust it as it goes. But I love being spontaneous and having a, a, a spontaneity in, in, in the work. And I know that from a distance, the color will mix. Well, you get up close, and it becomes very abstract. But that's what I was saying about that Japanism. That was a, a technique that, that, that a, the, a lot of the illustrators would use, and I, I love that because it, it, it gives me a lot of freedom, and it's, it's really a lot of fun to, uh, to do that. And you can use more vibrant color that way. If you're copying a photograph, you're just copying the grays and everything, the nuances, and it's not so exciting. It's just, you know, it just, you look at it and go, oh, that's just a copy of a photograph. Yeah. But this, is, this, to me, is a lot more more exciting to do that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Here, we'll put it back now. Here. I'll try to put it back without squeaking the, the speaker. Thank you, Kath. And I know that there are some even more um, dramatic examples of Peter's um, use of color sitting over here in the case of a few studies, and perhaps he might um, talk about some of that. Peter, let me know if I can help you pick okay. anything up. Um, yes, yeah, so let's take some of these down if we could here. And this is what I really wanted to share with all of you. Um, 
if I could. Um, I was thinking, your, your question is, how, did, how, did, um, how do you start a painting? How do you get a painting started? Go ahead, ask me the question. <laughs> How do you start a painting, Peter? Okay, it's it's really it's re it's really kind of interesting how I started. I, I started in all kinds of different ways, but some ways I started is um, I will do a pastel like this, like this, and then this is not finished. In fact, this might be in the might, this might go into the masters. This painting here, but this is the pastel that I did first on location. See that? It's, it's, it's not, as I say, it's not finished. And again, I wanted to get that dynamic sort of feeling in this. And this is the, the pastel here. And so I do this on location. I like working in pastel because it's so easy to, to move around. You don't have to wait for it to paint, um, uh, to dry, I mean. You don't have to wait for it to dry. And uh, it's just a very, very direct way of working. So, um, but... I've, I've talked to a lot of people, and I think it's true. A lot of seascape paintings, they all kind of look alike. You got the crashing waves, you got the big rocks, you got, you know, uh, you can see the little transparency through the waves. And I thought, no, I want to do something that's that's different. And and so I've um, I, I go out there and I paint, and sometimes I even imagine in my in my mind um, what I want to what I want to paint. And then I go there and I try to see it. Now, the other thing, too, I want to tell you is that when you're painting, you've got the rods and the cones in your eyes. And if you come out of a dark place and go into a, a sunny place, it will, um, you, you don't see things the same way as you do. If you come out of a dark, you know, even Plato in his um, uh, uh, analogy, allergy of the caves, um, you know, where he says you come out of the cave, you come in the bright light, you can't see things correctly. That sort of thing fascinates me. So I enjoy actually painting into the glare of the, of the light uh, because of that. Now, here's a painting that I'm working on now that I may use for the Autry. And this is uh, the pastel here. And you see it's the, the wet sand here and the, the glare here. And then this is all in shade. And, um, and this is pastel. You just, you actually, you know, pastel is just finger painting. You just do like that and you get, you know, it all comes together. Did you do that on a dark paper? Yeah, on a dark, on a, on a, uh, a fairly dark gray Canson paper. And so then. And these two. Here's, here's my painting that I'm working on from that, which is this painting here. Yeah, I got it. Yep. So kind of interesting, different than any other sort of seascape that you, you see. Um, you know, I wanted to get this, this in the, 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 the foam action. I love painting foam. Foam is so great. I mean, it's just, <laughs> it makes so many interesting patterns and, and, uh, and it just it keeps moving and it explains the surface of the water. And I really make a study of foam now. It's really fun. Here's another uh, painting that I'm, I'm working on too. And this one, I wanted to show the ebb and flow. I'm going to get a little more glare in here and some of that glare up in here. And I think that'll be, make a very interesting type of painting. And it deals with color harmony. You know, you're really dealing like a piece of jewelry. You're thinking of it not, not as something realistic, but as something uh, precious. And, and having a, a great harmony here of the oranges and then the blues and so forth. So that's kind of an interesting way of working. Um, as I mentioned to you that um, a lot of times when I'm painting, I try to come up with ideas and I use video camera. I don't usually, I don't take photos uh, anymore. I use video cameras because they will show me the flowing, this and that. And, and then even if I see something that's there, I'll usually move it around a little bit for the composition uh, points of view. Uh, but sometimes, how much time do we have? <laughs> I think we've got um, about 10 minutes left. And oh, I have okay. one more question for you when you okay. are ready. Uh, uh, <laughs> sometimes uh, I'm, I'm really interested in the human mind uh, and, 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 and how we think. Um, 
uh, most of the time I, I can know how I think because I'm me. I don't know how you think, uh, but I know how <laughs> I think. And I think mostly in words. And I, I think probably and most of my memories are in words. But occasionally I have a memory that's visual that I can remember. Even when I was a child, I can remember things that I'd seen and I could still see them in my mind's eye. And I try to, um, I, I, I try to um, visualize things like that well, before I go to sleep or I try to see things sometimes. And sometimes some scenes will come to me. I've talked to other artists about this and they say, you know, some of them say uh, they can actually see the painting before they finish it. I usually can't, but sometimes I can. And I think that's really kind of an interesting thing to do right. because I'm, I'm working with my subconscious somewhat. Yeah. And then coming up with a vision going, oh, that's beautiful. Oh, yes. I like, oh, maybe I should get a little more red over here. <laughs> or, or, or maybe this should be a little darker over there or something like that. And so those are always kind of fun things. So I, a lot of times I'll make little sketches like this. Oh. Yeah, like this. I don't know if you can see this. It's a little sketch of some waves. And uh, yeah, with the glare, looking into the glare, you see? And uh, when you look into a glare, if you photograph that and you look at the photograph, everything's black and white. It turns all the color into black and white. But when you know that's not what it looks like, it looks more like this. And that's a, a wave uh, breaking. So. Um, so anyway, those are some of the ways that I, I, I work. Uh, does that answer some of your question? Um, and, I, and I, I do have, I do have some more pastels, but I, I don't think we need to see them. I think we've, we've gone over. And... Well, I think people could always you know, certainly come up and, and, and look at some of these pastels and, and look through, um, this book of pastels. But, uh, in addition, I, there are a couple of observations about these two vertical paintings in particular that I think are super interesting. Um, first of all, they are vertical. Most landscapes, especially seascapes, tend to be horizontal because the horizon line is so unending in seascapes. And so to even, even choose the vertical orientation, I think, is a bit of an artistic risk. And then secondly, Peter described himself, of course, as a realist earlier, but these are really very, very abstract paintings, and they can be divided down into shapes and lines and things like that and then they come together as a seascape when sort of viewed in their totality so there is a real um, abstract understanding of composition and harmonies and balances and everything that it needs to pull off success uh, successful um, abstraction in these paintings so there's that sort of underlying I think sort of quality and foundation to all of your work Oh, um, but the, the the last question that I have for you and then I think we have a few minutes for um, questions from folks here if there are uh, some was this, do you have a, a sort of unifying or a coherent philosophy that you approach your new, you know, each blank canvas with? And perhaps you could talk about that a little bit. You when I start question. off a painting, I, I want to try to understand what type of painting I'm going to do. Is it going to be a painting like this painting over here that is, is, um, exciting and, and a lot of action going on, or is it going to be more poetic and soft-spoken like, like this painting here that's a little slower pace and, and more gem-like in, in, in quality? And those are different categories. And so I see um, paintings in, 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 in categories, uh, and I want to, it depends what category I'm going to work in. I mean, I do figure paintings too, and, and those come under uh, a different category, too. But I particularly like, um, uh, in landscape painting now, painting the ocean, because it is so multi-layered and, and fascinating. You can never, you know, like Heraclitus said, you never step into the same river twice because it's always moving. Well, the ocean is like that. It's always changing. And, and you know, every sunset is different from every other sunset, and every wave is different from every other wave. And, uh, and it gives you, you a sense of freedom because you're not copying exactly what's there. If you, you're painting the, the high Sierras or the desert, you're, you're there for three hours and painting exactly what you see, but you can't do that with the ocean because it's always changing. And so it, it adds, I can add my spontaneity into that. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but it, it, it really, uh, it, it, to me, that's the kind of the creative part that I get excited about. 
Thank you. And the ocean is the perfect topic for that, for all those reasons that you just mentioned. Now I understand why you are so drawn to the ocean. Um, I think we have some time for a few questions. Yes. Wait, I need, to take, oh. I need the mic. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so, so very much. How come you don't paint horizontals? How come I'm sorry, I, I, don't, I don't paint what? Horizontals. I do. Oh, I do paint horizontal. I um, actually, um, this is a fairly horizontal. No, painting. no, no. I'm talking horizontal. That looks square to me. <laughs> no, that, that, that is, is uh, oh, that's uh, 20 by 24. Yeah. But I do, most, most of the time, I paint horizontally. Okay. Most right. of the time, I paint uh, I'm talking... uh, 30 by 40. Yeah, uh, okay. Um, most of them tend to, these have to be uh, more vertical. Right. It's just, um, it's kind of an interesting format. I mean, it's kind of nice painting, but most, most seascapes you see, Tend to be more horizontal. I'm right? I'm yet to find one. I'm I'm hard, I'm looking very specifically for a nice horizontal seascape, and I have yet to find one that is of substantial size. So maybe. Well, you know, it's interesting you mentioned that because uh, we have a, we, uh, my wife has a, a, a gallery show going on right now, and and I do have one or two. Um, oh, you do. Horizontal okay. uh, I'll talk to then, talk to Elaine. Yeah. Talk to Elaine and, and yes. talk to her. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Peter. Uh, you seem to be working on several projects at the same time. Yes. Uh, is that because you get bored with something, or you just need to recharge and go on to the next one? I need to freshen my eye. Uh, a lot of times I'll have a mirror when I'm working. A lot of times I take photographs. I, I use my, my camera and I'll photograph it when I get to a certain stage and then I'll look at the photograph and then I'll play with it and say, well, what, what about if I make that darker or make that lighter? And I look in a mirror so it's a reversed image so that I can get a little more objective about my work. Um, um, interestingly, this, this painting here for the Autry, I, I probably spent about two weeks on it just nonstop. And I knew exactly what I wanted to do, and I did, I, you know, it was on my um, uh, calendar. I knew I had to get it done by a certain date, and and so I just I just cranked on that. And then I have uh, another a lot of other um, deadlines to work with and commissions. So I, I want to get them started and get them to the point where they're about eighty five percent done, because after that it's all downhill, and that's. The, the first part mm -hmm. is the hard part. And once you get those bones in, um, then it's, it's a lot easier to finish. And I know I can, I can get it finished and it'll look, it'll look fairly good. So I can kind of tell I've got a, I can't tell always, but sometimes I tell that I, I've got a good winner there if I get about 85% done and, and then we'll see how it looks at the end. And, uh, does that make sense? Good, yeah. Peter. Oh, oh. oh yeah, Jim. Um, we're talking primarily about your landscapes here, but you're also very well known for your body of work that I, I don't want to call it spiritual, I don't want to call it historic, whatever, but there's a lot of figurative work that you've done that is just fantastic. Could you talk a little bit about uh, what inspires you in that direction? Good question. Well, you know, um, I don't paint, I, I never felt good about painting um, cowboys or Native American Indians because it's not, I, I don't feel it's really part of my um, upbringing. I, I didn't grow up riding horses as a lot of my friends did and a lot of the people. So I've, I've kind of steered away from doing figures of the West. There's so many great Western artists there and uh, um, I'm, I'm more attracted to landscapes, but I, I love ancient history um, and I love um, I love the opera. I paint a lot of opera scenes, believe it or not. I, I actually, they've let me paint an opera in progress while it's going on, and I'm up in a little lighting booth doing uh, plein air paintings of, of, of the opera, because I love the lighting techniques that they have and the, um, and the costumes and so forth. Uh, and and uh, I love doing figure painting that, that tell a kind of uh, story. Like Amy, you said that the storytelling is is very important. Um, when you're painting an opera, they have stories. Uh, I also uh, one of the things I love doing is going and painting at night and painting statues. That I a lot of times I'll bring my own colored lights and light the statues up, 
uh, and make kind of interesting uh, color harmonies. Um, I've gone to caves and painted in caves uh, and brought, um, you know, Elaine and I went to Albuquerque. We flew into Albuquerque one time, stayed the night, and drove all the way to Carlsbad Cavern so I could paint in the caves down there. <laughs> um, and we got down there, and they just changed the lighting from the colored lighting they had to, to halogen white lights. And I was just so upset. So then whenever I go to caves, I bring my own colored lights. I went to Shasta uh, Caves up by uh, Mount Shasta and brought you know, hundreds of yards of wire and my colored lights, and they let me light up the, the uh, cathedrals, and I'm, I was fascinated doing that. So I, I don't know if I'm answering your question quite, but I like doing things that are, uh, have a color harmony to them, if I can possibly do that, or have a historical sense. I was fortunate to have been asked to paint the 14 Stations of the Cross for the new uh, Caruso Catholic Center at USC, and Elaine and I went to Jerusalem and spent about a month there, and I got, to, I got to paint inside the Church of the Holy Sepulchre at night. They locked me in by myself at night, and I got to paint all night long in, in, inside, and that was really a fascinating thing to do. Um, but yeah, figure painting is, is a lot of fun, too. It's a really kind of different, um, and, and you can tell stories. And, and, uh, uh, but I, I really like to get a, a feeling of, of harmony in my work, if I can. You know, a feeling uh, of, 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 of color harmony, too. And um, so, uh, yeah. Oh, Mary, that's my sister. <laughs> so I've known you all your, all your life, but um, I don't get the opportunity to hear you like this. This is so much fun for Eileen and me to hear you. I have two questions. One is when you were talking about, for instance, the, the uh, seascapes, how much does the seascape that you see speak to you? And how much do you decide, I want to paint it this way? In other words, if you've had a bad day, bad traffic, you get out there, I'm painting this angry seascape, or I want, I just need placid. How much, or how much, do you, do you understand what I'm asking? That's the I, first question. I think I do. Okay. <laughs> how much does it speak to you, and how much do you decide how you're going to paint it, what you see, or how does it yeah. come from inside or here? And then the second thing is um, I just wanted to play on what you were talking about, the spirituality of your paintings, which I find in your seascapes, in your landscapes, not just the overtly religious paintings. And it's something that you have in so many of your paintings, and it comes from inside. I wonder if you could... Talk about that. So the two. I'll things. talk about the first question. I mean, the second question first. And generally, I have a very positive uh, viewpoint of, of human nature and of of, of of the universe. And you know, I have. Uh, I like to paint things that are uplifting, and I don't want to make them somber or, or 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 downcast. I want I want to be happy, and so I try to paint um, things that that uh, um, lift the spirit lift a soul. And, and so that's always a big part of, of just about everything I do. Uh, I have painted some dark scenes, but I, I, I just, you know, I don't do that very much. That's not really me so much. Uh, the first question was, how much does the ocean speak to me, or how much do I bring to the ocean to, to paint what I do? Um, when I go down to the ocean, I find it, uh, or any landscape, I find it a, a, a resource that, that uh, I see, and there's something there. There's some little part that, that, that speaks to me, and I go, ah, that's it, right there. See, that? Oh, it's gone right now, but it'll come back. Oh, okay, there it is again. Yeah, you know. <laughs> and, and, and then I go, that's what I'm looking for. Okay, let me just sort of emphasize that. So um, uh, it's, it, it's kind of like that. And then also when I'm working it out, and maybe I'm working on a painting for uh, uh, two or three weeks or so, uh, it, things change, you know, and, and, and uh, I will always change things to try to get that, that effect. There's a great story by George Innes. Uh, his son was a painter, too, George Innes Jr. He wrote a book about his father, and he brought a painting in for his father to look at. And George Innes was quite a character. And anyway, he, um, uh, uh, he brought this, this big uh, painting of, of uh, 
spring and mountains in and uh, blossoms on the trees and, and flowers and so forth. And, and George Innes started to work on it on top of it. He said, well, you know, you should do it like this, with it like this. Two or three hours later, it turned into a snow scene. <laughs> <laughs> it was completely different. <laughs> and that happens sometimes. That happens sometimes when I'm working at home. Sometimes they just change, and, and I don't know. Sometimes those are my best paintings, but usually not. But, uh, yeah. yeah. This has been an absolutely fascinating evening. Um, thank you, Peter, so much for this insight into your working yeah. methods, your amazing art. Amy, thank you. And Stephen, thank you very much. I'm so honored to be here with the Autry and the Autry Masters and to be included as one of the artists. I, I've uh, enjoyed that for many, many years, and I thank you so much for having me. Well, we are grateful to have you in the show. And thank you also to Kathy for hosting oh, this amazing you, event Amy. and yeah. sharing your relationship with Peter. And um, we hope to see you all on February 11th. Thank you.